Already this week, a huge drop in Chinese prices and now more banking woes. Another record low in the growth rate of the outstanding stock of Chinese loans. Every year we keep hearing that the global economy is ready to turn a corner, to pick itself up and start recovering again. And inevitably that always fails, in large part because of what's happening in China. Now the implications go way beyond 2024. In fact, they're enormous and the consequences will be felt globally. Last year, the IMF said that they expected that one quarter of global growth in the next five years will come from China. But China has to actually get out of its current downturn to even achieve that. If it doesn't, and all the signs are aligning once again that it won't, the consequences will be felt everywhere. Now, we already have a great migration underway. We are looking to improve ourselves, to have a better quality of life, because in our country, the situation is getting worse and worse, and we are only looking for an opportunity. What we are looking for is to work. What does that look like if the Chinese can't manage to stabilize and turn things around? Now, at the end of last year, S&P Global, the ratings agency, was becoming a little more optimistic and constructive on 2024 with the usual caveats. What they wrote was, S&P Global ratings continue to expect most emerging markets to grow below trend in 2024. Weak growth of major trading partners, the US, Europe, and China, of course, will keep growth subdued in export-oriented sectors in the emerging markets. In some EMs, especially those in Asia and Europe, the activity seems close to bottoming out. However, we expect economic recoveries to be slow and highly susceptible to setbacks constrained by the weak global conditions. And global conditions that could get much weaker in large part because the Chinese don't live up to all these expectations. We think that the emerging market situation will bottom out because the Chinese are doing a lot to try to stabilize the economy. But what happens if all of those efforts come up empty? As I mentioned in the intro, we do this every year. Last year, it was reopening in China. Reopening in China was supposed to kick off this recovery that's now seemingly delayed. And in its wake, we have promises of government efforts and stimulus and everything else that will finally kickstart the Chinese economy and lead to this bottoming out process. But the more time goes on, the fewer are buying into it because the results have yet to show up. We've got more data today, in addition to really troubling credit statistics, economic data, financial data, all of it pointing in the direction of China being unable to get itself out of this predicament. And therefore, we do have to consider that, that effect on the rest of the global system, not just the economy, financial system, politics, and everything else. Now, just this week, Ratings agency Fitch cut its outlook for Chinese debt in large part because, well, they don't really trust that the stimulus efforts are going to pay off. Here's what Fitch wrote. Fitch believes that fiscal policy is increasingly likely to play an important role in supporting growth in the coming years, which, will keep, which could keep debt on a steady upward trend. It, that's the thing. It's going to. Contingent liability risk may also be rising as lower nominal growth exacerbates challenges to managing high economy-wide leverage. That's a huge risk. But here's the big thing. The degree to which fiscal support reignites underlying GDP growth is a key uncertainty for our debt path, meaning they're not really sure it's going to work because so far, everything that China has done has not worked. And what that has meant is that, number one, the economy doesn't recover, but number two, it leaves more and more debt and more and more projections of debt because as the economy, economy fails to respond to stimulus, that just means the Chinese government will have to do more stimulus and they become locked in this stimulus cycle where nothing ever gets stimulated except for the debt underwriters in the financial system. This is the same scenario that the Chinese followed in the wake of the Great Recession in 2000, 2008 and 2009 because it proved not to be a recession. Except back then, the Chinese used private debt in combination with public debt, but largely private debt to try to work their way out of what was, what was thought to be a temporary global stumble. But as, it, as more time passed and the years went by in the 2010s and the silent depression 
as silent as it was, more and more emerged, the Chinese realized that they had, they had increased the level of private debt enormously without generating the recovery. Now that the private debt has gone too far and with no economic recovery to speak of, they got all the debt and none of the economy, they're left with this, with this, this unworkable imbalance that means they either have to really let the air out here or the public part of it has to step up and try to fill that gap that the private economy and private banking system will no longer is no longer able to. But in shifting the debt burden from the private economy and private banks to the public sector, not only does that entail its own set of risks, there also is the, the inconvenient fact that it's far more inefficient, which gets us back to the original question that we're asking here and the one that was raised by Fitch. How successful, how effective will this Chinese stimulus actually be? And the results that keep coming in say, not only do we expect it to be ineffective, it is so ineffective the Chinese economy is threatening to become even worse. In fact, some of the recent statistics suggest substantial deterioration and degradation right now. Forget the rest of 2024, we've got some immediate risk to take care of here and some immediate risk to really consider. Before we even get to the macroeconomic statistics and the credit statistics, which are really ugly, we know it's not going well because of how the financial system is performing. We've got the currency that wants to go only lower, the saga and this drama going on with the, the, the onshore exchange rate that continues to hit or very close, move very close to the 2% daily limit set by the PBO, PBOC, showing that the currency markets want to go lower. The CNY wants to go down and CNY going down is a bad sign. A bad sign about China as well as the global implications. Beyond just the currency exchange rate, Chinese government bonds. Yields, that, yields in China are falling and pretty precipitously, and they have been since November. That's a, that's a time period that we keep coming back to. Since November, bond yields are going down, which if you, if you listen to mainstream sources, that's all about expectations for rate cuts. No, same there as it is here. Lower bond rates mean lower growth and inflation expectations. Lower growth and inflation expectations that are being met by every shred of data that continues to come out of China. It's not about rate cuts. It's about why government officials might actually end up cutting rates in the future. It's the circumstances that today are proving to be the opposite of what we expect for the emerging markets to be able to bottom out. Not only is the 10-year hovering around its lowest level in about 20 years, we've got lows in the five-year and two-year rates too, suggesting that there's more nervousness, no more nervousness in China about the current situation. These, those are the two-year and the five-year Chinese government bonds are closing in on the 2020 lows. 2020 lows. Again, suggesting that not just for the, for the local economy, but for global situation, the risks are rising, if not already the reality on the ground in the Chinese system. We got more data this week that shows there are very, very little impact from government efforts on anything. I mentioned in a recent video, the sharp deflationary numbers in Chinese consumer prices. It's the third largest monthly decline in the last 20 years because of a variety of factors, including coming back off of the Golden Week holiday in February. But even so, even with those seasonal quirks in mind, it was the third worst March in the last 20 years, suggesting that Chinese consumers are indeed tightening their belts all over again. They splurge a little bit during the, during the holiday week, they travel, they shop and do some of those things. But once they get back to normal, back to normal has been an incredibly weak economy. So that shows up in China's consumer prices. Chinese producer prices, the one indication out, if you had to pick one out of any, that's the one that you should always focus on because of the high, high degree of correlation between China's PPI and pretty much everything around the world. You want to know what the direction, what direction the global economy is going to be taking. Look at China's PPI. You want to know what direction for consumer prices in U.S. or Europe or anywhere else. Look at China's PPI. There's a close correlation, and that correlation starts with producer prices that continue to drop. Why? 
because nothing is working in China. And the situation is getting more and more difficult, not less difficult, not turning a corner, not the foundation for global growth and recovery in 2024, more and more difficult. Friday, to end the week, the Chinese reported on their global trade statistics, including exports and imports. The export side, well, people were expecting to have a small decline given the comparison to March 2023 and the reopening that happened back then. But exports actually declined in U.S. dollar terms by nearly 8% year over year, which was a much sharper than expected drop and really a sharp drop which indicates that global demand for all the fuss about, hey, the global economy is picking up well, the Chinese aren't see it, seeing it, especially since when you look at some of the individual numbers, we got more sharp declines in exports that were sent to Europe and another big decline in the value, the U.S. dollar value of exports that were shipped to the United States. So once again, we see how there is a global connection, a global contribution to the problems in China. Yeah, China has its own internal issues, but the external environment these global factors they keep talking about aren't helping the situation either. And then, of course, the Chinese economy, because it is a pivotal and centrally located part of the global economic system, weakness coming into China, weakness inside of China gets transferred to the rest of the world. Imports also declined in the month of March, though the decline was only about 2%. They're buying less stuff from around the world, even as... The government is buying more stuff, which tells you that the weakness in the private economy is more than enough to offset whatever it is the government has been doing up to this point. The big story, however, continues to be Chinese banks. And they are, I mean, everything that keeps coming up from Chinese ba China's banking system proves why the government is shifting the debt burden or the, em the, the emphasis on debt from the private sector to the public sector. Despite the invitations in the form of liquidity programs from the PBOC, in the form of some modest rate cuts, in the form of likely private conversations that are not so much polite requests but more commands to start being more active in the real economy, the credit statistics in particular show that the banking system is doing the exact opposite. There's no wonder why we see deflationary price numbers come out of the Chinese system. According to the latest, uh, latest uh, report from the PBOC, the financial statistics report for the month of March, the outstanding stock of yuan loans increased by 9.6% year over year, which is another record low. But it's not so much just the record lows because we've gotten used to seeing them come out ever since the middle of last year. It's doing it on an accelerated path that goes back to around November and December last year. When China's bond yields turned sharply lower, we started to see a sharper deceleration in the outstanding stock of Chinese loans. As far as the immediate concerns in 2024 in China's economy, every time we see loan growth slow down in this kind of material fashion, though not quite to this deceleration, the degree of deceleration we're seeing now, but every time we see China's loan growth slow down, its economy inevitably slows down too, because of course it does. What is that going to mean for China's economy for the rest of this year? And then of course, the bigger picture moving forward. If history is a guide here, and we're talking about real recent history, we're not expecting or should not be expecting that China's economy is suddenly going to pick up here because the government is going to be wasting more funds and borrowing more. It seems like a pretty unrealistic expectation that with all of this happening, with no sign that the Chinese economy, banking system, any of it is actually, is actually responding favorably to the government's efforts, every time we see credit growth get weaker, like we're seeing now, we should not expect stabilization in the economy, we expect it to get even weaker, which is what the markets are actually telling us, both the exchange value of the currency, as well as government bond yields, lower growth and inflation expectations. Well, we've got the lower growth and inflation already in China, and they're not, look like they're, they're not looking like they're gonna turn around soon. 
So given all of these developments, we have both near-term and big-picture implications. In the near term, China is supposed to be turning a corner and helping the global economy bottom out emerging markets in particular and start recovering all over again. But in every single category, in every single way, data comes in that suggests this is not happening. In fact, the opposite is happening, where it looks like the situation is becoming even more difficult, even more dire than it was just a few months ago. You've got the currency exchange rate. I've seen why it wants to go down to the point that the PBOC is pulling out its hair, trying to figure out how to keep it above the daily limit. We've got bond yields that are moving sharply lower, lower growth and inflation expectations, not good there. We've got macroeconomic data across the board. While it was somewhat less awful in more recent months, that was just a golden week skew. And now we get past the, the week holiday and in, into the rest of the calendar year, the macroeconomic statistics start to look increasingly dark all over again. So every way you look, the, the current situation in China is back to where it was to end last year. So there's the, the immediate impact will be, well, lower growth around the rest of the global economy. Maybe the emerging markets don't actually bottom out. And as far as inflation is concerned, more disinflation, if not outright deflation, coming from the Chinese. And not just the Chinese, but those closely connected to it. But we also have the big picture to consider here, the, the longer run trajectory of a world in which China is continually weakening. Every path that they've gone down trying to restart the economy has come up short. And so the global economy will continue to come up short. In the big picture, we have these global consequences for a, an already weak and already bad situation around much of the world that gets even weaker and even worse. The global consequences are likely to be enormous. They've got weakness that's going to impact places that are desperately struggling already. It's going to lead to more migration, more uncertainty, more instability. The details behind China's recent deflationary statistics are pretty sobering, and I've got those for you at the video link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. Until next time, take care.